the longest-running American animated series, the longest-running American sitcom, and the longest-running American scripted primetime television series are the achievements of The Simpsons Show. But the best name to call this show should be The TV Show Got the Most Accurate Predictions of All Time. We are pretty sure if you grew up in America, then you must have watched some episodes, or if you don't, then at least you have heard about the sitcom The Simpsons. This series has become a part of public culture and is so familiar to many people. What has made the series emerge among other sitcoms and animations is not just because it is close to the daily life of Americans, but also how precisely it predicted future events. Recently, the American most famous cartoon series, according to IMDb, has once again shown the world its superpower. The prediction for 2024 has some connections to biblical events, and even the man who has numerous times appeared in the series, that man is no one else but Donald Trump. Let's find out what could happen with these predictions of the Simpson family. The 2024 year was already a crazy year in the early days, and Donald Trump is at the top of the Simpson prediction. In a 2015 episode titled, Bart to the Future, Homer Simpson is depicted flying past a sign in the background that reads, Trump 2024. Interestingly, the episode came way before Trump had even become president. Donald Trump is now on his way to returning to the White House, although he facing multiple charges for his criminal cases, he still dominates Joe Biden on every step. But not just the Simpson. The Bible has its own prediction for Donald Trump, and you would believe it. We have mentioned this in a few previous videos on our channel. Donald Trump might not be perfect, but we could trust him in his ability. Trump's career was filled with numerous numbers of seven, the number that has a vital part in the Bible and is closely attached to God's creations. He started his career as a host of the show The Apprentice, and his role lasted for seven seasons after he decided to follow the political path. It took him exactly seven years from 2010 to have the first time of being the president of America. In the Bible, there is a number of seven related to the creation. In the book of Genesis, God creates the world in six days and rests on the seventh day, establishing the pattern of the seven-day week. This sets the stage for the symbolic significance of seven as representing completeness or perfection. The seventh day of the week, the Sabbath, is designated as a day of rest and worship in Judaism and Christianity. It symbolizes the completion of God's work of creation and serves as a reminder of God's restorative and redemptive purposes. Although Donald Trump is not perfect at all, and we cannot use the creation of God to make a comparison with him. Matter of fact, for someone who disagrees with the way Trump led the country during his presidency, make a comparison about the end-of-day event is probably more related to him. In the book of Revelation, there are a series of sevens, such as the seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls, which depict God's judgment and the culmination of history leading to the establishment of God's kingdom. Coincidentally, Donald Trump also faced seven charges for his crime this year, which made the comparison of him and the prophecy of the end time more realistic. But even the event of the end time wasn't actually for the end of all of us. In fact, the whole concept of the end time is to teach us a lesson of keeping our faith in Jesus' power, and it's the battle between God and evil and the concept of imperfection and the acknowledgement of human fallibility are prevalent themes in many religious teachings, including those attributed to Jesus in Christian scriptures. One notable instance is found in the New Testament in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 48, where Jesus says, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This statement is often interpreted as a call to strive for moral and spiritual perfection, to emulate the goodness and holiness of God. However, it's important to understand the context in which Jesus spoke these words. In the same passage, Jesus is teaching about love, forgiveness, and the importance of treating others 
with kindness and compassion, even those who may not deserve it. Jesus emphasized the idea that all humans are flawed and in need of redemption. In Christian teachings, Jesus often spoke about the unexpected nature of divine blessings and the kingdom of God. One notable example is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, verses 20, 21. Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. This passage illustrates Jesus' teaching that the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed externally, but rather it exists within the hearts and souls of individuals. It emphasizes the internal spiritual nature of the kingdom and the unexpected ways in which it manifests. Jesus frequently used parables to illustrate the concept of unexpected blessings and divine intervention. For example, the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the yeast both highlight the idea that something small and seemingly insignificant can grow and produce remarkable results, symbolizing the surprising and transformative power of God's kingdom. The most special thing usually came from the least expected, and Donald Trump obviously wasn't the exception. As an example of how beloved he is to the Christian community, say all you want about how Trump is a fake Christian or how he offended God. The man voters has 86% of the Christians in his first presidency, and estimated in this 2024 election, he is having 75% of Christians will vote for him. That number can be explained by his effort to fight for the community of Christianity. In the book of Revelation, there is mention of the seven spirits of God. Revelation 1, 4, 3, 1, 4, 5, 5, 6. Which symbolize the fullness and perfection of the Holy Spirit's work and presence. And in the book of Revelation, Jesus addresses seven churches in Asia Minor, each representing different spiritual conditions and challenges faced by early Christian communities. These letters contain prophetic messages regarding the church's perseverance, repentance, and ultimate victory. Trump might not be the one that you wanted, but he could possibly the chosen by God. The concept of being chosen by Jesus also extends beyond his immediate disciples to include all believers who respond to his call to follow him. Trust in God's spirits and trust in his power. He will lead the way and will bring us a brighter future. The next prediction from the Simpson family related to a third world war could occur this year and funny how it is happening. Since last year, October, the war between Israel and Palestine has once again blasted out after a surprise attack from Hamas. The later on actions of both sides are brutal retaliation. The UN has failed to release an order for a ceasefire to save hostages. And when the situation didn't go any better, Iran joined, throwing in the unprecedented attack by missiles and drones to Israel. The prospect of a third world is absolutely high because of the intensity that has already gone through the roof many years ago. Jesus' teachings on war emphasize principles of peace, reconciliation, and the avoidance of violence. His message promotes a profound critique of the destructive nature of conflict and its impact on humanity. Despite who is right and who is wrong when violence occurs, no one really wins in a war. Mostly civilians are the ones who take the suffering. Jesus rejected the principle of an eye for an eye and instead encouraged his followers to turn the other cheek and to refrain from seeking vengeance. Matthew 5, 38, 39. This radical ethic of non-retaliation challenges the mindset of retribution that underpins many conflicts, highlighting the futility and moral bankruptcy of seeking to address grievances through violence. The wars between these countries have been prolonged for 76 years, the Israelites, Iranians, and now is Iran. They are all taking an endless suffering for no reason. 
Jesus praised peacemakers and emphasized the importance of reconciliation in resolving conflicts, Matthew 5, 9, Matthew 18, 15, 17. He taught that true greatness lies in seeking reconciliation and forgiveness rather than pursuing domination or victory at the expense of others. When war breaks out, it often represents a failure to pursue peaceful solutions and a breakdown of efforts to reconcile differences. Most people call this a religious war, but the point of the conflict is believed to regain the sovereignty of Jerusalem. Jesus had deep compassion for the suffering of innocent people, including those caught in the crossfire of conflicts. He wept over the city of Jerusalem, lamenting the destruction that would come upon it. Luke 19.41, 44. Wars invariably result in the suffering and deaths of countless innocent civilians, bringing shame upon those responsible for instigating and perpetuating the violence. Jesus proclaimed the arrival of the kingdom of God, characterized by righteousness, peace, and justice. Luke 17, 20, 21. He taught his followers to seek first the kingdom of God and its values, which stand in stark contrast to the values of the world's kingdoms built on power, domination, and warfare. When nations prioritize war over peace, they betray the principles of God's kingdom and bring shame upon themselves. The act of throwing wars and religious conflicts is a sign of the end time, which marks the comeback of Jesus. The Simpson also predicted this a long time ago, and that is the crazy part of how accurate it is. When is Jesus coming back? When you read or hear a question like that, are you looking for a date? Yeah, right. I hope not. Many have tried that game in the past and have come up empty. Probably the most famous and now stupid book title that I can think of was the aptly named 88 Reasons Why the Rapture is in 1988. When 1988 came and went without too many rising from their graves, a new book was brought out called 89 Reasons Why the Rapture Is in 1989. And I'm sure lots more people still bought the second book. Whenever we are dealing with the timing of the Lord Jesus' return, there are two scriptures that should always be kept in mind. Firstly, the often quoted verse. Matt 24, 36 to 8 and 39. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what a murat would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. I personally don't think that anyone will know the exact day of Jesus' return until it takes place. Jesus bore this fact out in several passages, emphasizing the need to be found ready and waiting when the Master does return. Now, having said all of that, I do believe, however, that we are called to examine the signs of the times and be able to interpret the season in which we live. The second scripture I wanted to bring out states, Matt 16, 1, 3. The Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, When evening comes, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. We are called to understand and interpret the signs of the times in which we live. Now, the actual signs that associate Jesus' return will be left for another study. What I mainly want to examine in this study is whether the Bible gives any indication of the general timing of the return. I would also add at the beginning of this study that any interpretation of types from the Old Testament that do not have supporting New Testament doctrine, like this study, is automatically on shaky ground. Now, I don't usually undermine my own studies like this, but you do need to be aware 
that types do not hold the same weight as doctrine. I simply pass on these types of the plan of God because I have found them interesting and ask that you yourselves weigh the validity of them. One thing that amazes me about God is that He works all things out according to His will and the plan that He established before time. Everything is orderly, not simply left to chance. Even when dealing with salvation and the number that shall be saved, we read. Rome 11, 25, 26 I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel shall be saved. God has established a limit for the church called the full number of the Gentiles. Once this number is reached, He will once again turn back to Israel and complete His promises that He made to that nation in the Old Testament. While we do not know what this number is, or why He said it for that matter, God does and works all things out in accordance with His will. EPH 111 So if God has specific numbers set aside for those that will be saved, does He also have the timing of events worked out beforehand? Of course He does. And this is what I want to look at now. The sun and the moon were created on the fourth day to give light to the earth. And so it was after 4,000 years of human history that the true light of the world, the true Son, Jesus Christ, came into this world to shine His light upon this dark world. Man was created on the sixth day, as six is the number of men. Rev. 13.18 And just as God created all things in six days, so is this a picture, I believe, that God has given mankind 6,000 years to live and rule over the earth before His rule, and kingdom is established on earth. Now there are approximately 2,000 years from Adam to Abraham, approximately 2,000 years from Abraham to Jesus, and now we are approximately another 2,000 years from the time of Christ. So what's left? Well, we have the last day, the seventh day, which was to be the day of rest. And there are no prizes for guessing that this corresponds to the millennial kingdom that Jesus shall set up on earth at his return. Then there shall be rest and peace not experienced since before the fall. See Isaiah 11, 1, 9. And we know that God has ordained this kingdom to last for 1,000 years. Rev 20, 1, 7. Hosea 5, 14, 6, 2. For I will be like a lion to Ephraim, like a great lion to Judah. I will tear them to pieces and go away. I will carry them off, with no one to rescue them. Then I will go back to my place until they admit their guilt, and they will seek my face. In their misery they will earnestly seek me. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but He will heal us. He has injured us, but He will bind up our wounds. After two days He will revive us. On the third day, He will restore us, that we may live in His presence. If you read the book of Hosea, you will see that it is about God's awesome love for Israel, despite their continual spiritual adultery. At the end of chapter 5, we find the scripture previously mentioned. It speaks of someone who is like a lion to Ephraim, like a great lion to Judah. In scripture, only two people are likened to a lion. Firstly, the Lord Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah, and secondly, Satan, who goes around like a lion looking for people to devour. The passage carries on and states that this person would go back to my place until they admit their guilt. Clearly, this has nothing to do with Satan, but it has to do with the Lord Jesus, whom the Jewish nation rejected. Jesus himself said, Matt 23, 37, 39. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, is a title for the Messiah, 
well known to the Jewish people of Jesus' day. So he was saying that the nation of Israel would be left desolate until they acknowledged the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. This is exactly the same as the prophecy we have just read in Hosea. So look now to how the Israelites respond. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us, that we may live in his presence. Joshua 3, 3, 4. And they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about two thousand cubits by measure. Do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. I have heard, and I pass it on for something to consider, that this crossing into the promised land typifies the entering into heaven of both Jesus and his saints. You will notice that the Ark of the Covenant, picture of Jesus, crossed over, but the people were not allowed to follow any closer than about two thousand cubits. They were not to come closer, for they had not come this way before. This could very well be a picture of the fact that Jesus ascended into heaven, back to his Father, but his followers, as a body, could not follow any closer than about two thousand years later. Obviously, we have to be careful when dealing simply with types, but this would line up with the Hosea passage mentioned above. Notice also that it says that they were to follow about two thousand cubits behind. Don't try to establish exact dates because you will be exactly wrong. The whole point of this study is not to pinpoint a date, but to show that there are indicators in the Bible as to the general timing of His coming, so that you will be ready and can live with the blessed hope and the knowledge that Jesus is coming soon. But only God knows the exact time. You only have to turn on the TV news to see that many of the signs of His coming, most importantly, developments in Israel, are being fulfilled before our eyes. If you know anything about the tabernacle that God instructed Moses to build, you will know that it had three main areas, the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. Many books have been written on this subject, as it is an awesome type of the salvation of God. But there are many other pictures in the tabernacle, and I want to look at one of these now because it may shed further light as to the plan of God in regard to the length of time given to each of the ages. The outer court contained the altar and the labor, and man couldn't come any further if they didn't have a sacrifice upon the brazen altar. This area represents the period of the law, a fence that had the following dimensions enclosed the outer court. Exodus 27, 18. The length of the court shall be one hundred cubits, the width fifty throughout, and the height five cubits, made of fine woven linen. Thus the entire area of the fence that enclosed the outer court was one hundred length x fifty width x five height. The total area is fifteen hundred. We know from history that the total period of the law went for approximately fifteen hundred years. The holy place contained the golden candlestick, symbolizing Christ as the light, the table of showbread, Christ as the bread of life, and the altar of incense, Christ as our intercessor. This room speaks of the church age, and its dimensions were twenty cubits, length, x ten cubits, width, x ten cubits, height. Thus the total being twenty x ten x ten equal sign two thousand. This again, like other scriptures mentioned above, seems to indicate that God has set aside around two thousand years for the church age. The Holy of Holies contained the Ark of the Covenant, which was the very presence and power of God in their midst. This room speaks of the millennial kingdom in which the very presence and power of God shall be evident, as Jesus himself shall reign upon this earth. The dimensions of this room were ten cubits length, x ten cubits width, 
x10 cucubits, height. Thus it was to 10x10, x10 equal sign 1000. So, as discussed above, it is no coincidence that the kingdom on earth shall exist for 1000 years before the new heaven and new earth are established. Jesus is coming, and the plan of God will be established just as he has laid it out in his word. The points that I have written above I have found interesting as possible indicators as to the general timing of Jesus' return. But it is not fact. Always remember that we are not dealing with doctrine here. We are dealing with Old Testament types, and as such, there is definite room for error. Having said that, I still do find these types very interesting, and have written this study as points to consider and to weigh up. Jesus is coming soon, however, and this last generation has seen so much change in the world as the players in this end-time puzzle move quickly into position. Our eyes should be looking up, for Jesus will return shortly. The coming of Jesus Christ for his bride is called in Scripture the Blessed Hope. It is the hope above all hopes. Do you have this hope? If the types presented in this study prove to be true, it would seem that we are drawing close to end of the church age and that the rapture of the church is imminent. Isaiah 9, 6, 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Here is an example of a messianic passage which shows that the Messiah would reign on David's throne and that justice and righteousness would characterize his reign. An interesting thing to note with this passage is that the Messiah would be born and that he would be a son. In other words, the Messiah would be human. No surprises there then. But look also at the name given to this child, Mighty God and Everlasting Father. In other words, the Messiah would also be God. The Messiah would be both human and God. A perplexing prophecy, wouldn't you say? Explained only by the virgin birth of Jesus the Messiah. Isaiah 11, 1. 10. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his place of rest will be glorious. Please read the entire passage in Isaiah 11, for I have only quoted a portion of it above. But here we have another passage about the Messiah, and it shows us that not only would the Messiah rule from the throne of David, but he would be a descendant in the line of David. That is what is meant by, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. Jesse is King David's father. The Messiah would come through this line. Also, this passage shows that the Messiah will rule over the entire earth. This, then, is the main understanding that religious Jews have. They see the Messiah as a conquering, ruling king from the line of David. There is, of course, another picture given in the Old Testament of the Messiah. Isaiah 53. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, 
and by his wounds we are healed. Isaiah 53 is a very well-known prophetic passage about the Messiah. Even Jewish rabbis before the time of Jesus said that this passage was messianic. And what does it teach concerning the Messiah? Like Joseph, it shows that the Messiah would actually be rejected and suffer, but not for himself. The punishment that servant Messiah would take upon himself would bring us peace and healing. Concerning the apparent paradoxes, six in this passage, D. L. Moody wrote, Despised, yet accepted and adored, poor yet rich, to die yet to live, the rabbi said there must be a double Messiah to fulfill this chapter. Looking briefly at the life of Joseph, we find the following pictures of Jesus in his life. Matthew 16, 21. 23. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Okay, no prizes for this one. It is pretty obvious that Peter, who always had a habit of speaking out what the others were thinking, didn't know very much about the Messiah having to die. Peter wanted Messiah ben David. Peter wanted a conquering king, not a rejected servant. Of course, Peter understood things better by the time of his first sermon in the book of Acts 2.14.36. John the Baptist was the same. After recognizing Jesus and rightly calling him the Lamb, seven that takes away the sin of the world, in other words, John recognized that Jesus would be a sacrifice for sins. Later on in his life, as John sat in a lonely prison wondering what Jesus was going to do, we read of the doubts that came into John's mind. Finally, he sends his disciples to ask Jesus, Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? Matthew 11. 2. Jesus just wasn't acting like John thought the Messiah would act. Even in the book of Acts, after Jesus has spoken to the disciples for 40 days concerning the kingdom of God and the coming baptism of the Spirit, their only question to Jesus is, Lord, is it at this time you are going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Acts 1, 3, 6. In other words, when is the Davidic kingdom? When will you rule and reign like the prophecies foretold? Note also Jesus' answer in verse 8. Jesus says that it will happen, but it is not for them to know what time his Father has fixed for such things. And Here is the end of our video. Please leave a like and subscribe if you are enjoying this video. Hit the bell down below to get the latest video from our channel.